Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Matthew Taylor. I'm the RSO's Chief Executive. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event uh, entitled, Can Good Work Solve the Productivity Puzzle? Uh, just before we kick off, a reminder that we're filming tonight's event and live streaming over the web. So if you're joining us online, welcome. It's great to have you with us. Please do get involved in the discussion on Twitter. You can let us know your thoughts and questions using the hashtag good work. Tonight's event is brought to you by the RSA and by the Carnegie UK Trust. And we're going to be hearing from Carnegie's CEO, Sarah Davidson, at the close of tonight's event. Um, but if you want to know more uh, about the RSA or Carnegie UK Trust, contact us. You can do so through uh, our hashtag, the RSA org and Carnegie UK Trust. Uh, tonight, we're launching the publication, Can Good Work Solve the Productivity Puzzle, which you will uh, have uh, seen on the table when you came in. Make sure you pick up a copy uh, on the way out if you didn't pick one up coming in. We've been working with the Carnegie UK Trust over the last year to debate this question, Can Good Work Solve the Productivity Puzzle? The first thing I, I want to say in very brief introductory comments uh, is that good work matters and it's something we should care about irrespective of its links to productivity. Uh, the work we do is critical to our quality of life and well-being, work that is fair and decent, a work which offers scope for progression and fulfillment. That's important to individuals, it's important to a decent society. Today, the number of people in work in the UK is at a record high, and that's good news. But the quality and type of work that people have access to is under scrutiny. And there are many reasons for this. In increased job insecurity, uh, low, and, uh, low pay and pay not increasing very fast for a lot of people, and the changing nature of work in a digital age, issues around the impact of technology in the future. As well as serious inequalities in who has access to good work, the UK has also chronically low productivity growth, which constrains living standards and wages. So that's why these two issues are pressing issues and why the connections between them are very interesting. Now, to anyone who's not an economist, productivity may sound like a dry and abstract idea, but whether it's up or down is closely followed because historically improvements in productivity have been necessary to drive up living standards. Unfortunately for the UK, uh, productivity has been down for quite a while. The last time productivity growth was as low as it has been in recent years was the 1880s. So solving the UK's productivity crisis is the most fundamental challenge facing our economy. And if we care about good work, then we need to try to understand and to demonstrate how good work could play a central role in meeting the productivity challenge. So the publication we're launching tonight is a collection of essays on how this might be done. Because good work is complex. Productivity is very complex. So we don't have all the answers. But the essay collection brings together new research, learning, analysis from nearly 20 contributors who are expert in this debate from business, the academy, policy, trade unions. Uh, many of those contributors are in the audience tonight. So I'd like to thank you. Uh, for your contributions, and hopefully we can bring you into the discussion uh, as the evening proceeds. Um, and crucially, I want to open up the debate to all of you uh, who are here tonight, and there will be an opportunity for you to engage uh, later on. But first of all, we're delighted to have a really stellar lineup of speakers on our panel tonight to start this discussion. So let me just say a brief word to introduce them all to you. So. We'll be hearing first from Andy Haldane, who's Chief Economist at the Bank of England, but who will tonight be speaking in his capacity as Chair of the UK Government's Industrial Strategy Council. Then we'll hear from Tara Alice, who's Director of Research and Economics at McKinsey's United Kingdom and Ireland office, working closely with McKinsey Global Institute. She leads McKinsey's research on government and business, productivity, technology, adoption, and the future of work. Uh, and as I said earlier, finally joining us on stage for some closing remarks, we'll have Sarah Davidson, CEO of the Carnegie UK Trust, which is a charitable foundation which promotes um, uh, and works to improve the lives of people throughout the UK and Ireland through policy and practice. So uh, th the way it's going to work is that we're going to hear briefly from each um, of our speakers. I'm going to have a conversation with them up here 
on the stage expose the contradictions in their positions and the intellectual challenges with their approaches. Um, and then I'm going to open it up uh, to all of you to get involved. So I think it's going to be a fascinating hour or so. Uh, and to start off, please welcome Andy Haldane. <clears throat> Thank you for that, uh, Matthew. Uh, evening, everyone. Oh, God, I forgot, I forgot to introduce Kate Bell. <laughs> I'm so sorry. sorry Matthew. I've been doing this for so many years, and I've never done that before. Please. <laughs> this is like a terrible moment for me. Like, and Kate's a friend as well, and you're, sta and you're standing up, and I, you know, just get on with it. All right, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kate Bell, uh, Head of Rights at International Social Economics Department at the TUC, leading their work on boosting employment rights, promoting social economic policies that benefit working people and building international solidarity. And I didn't forget you because you were mean about my report. I'm just not that kind of person. So uh, back to you, Andy. <laughs> well, thank you, Matthew, for that, that very professional introduction. Um, and for my two rounds of applause, it's the first time ever, <laughs> before I'd spoken a word. Um, Happy New Year, uh, everyone. Um, I want to make um, uh, 10 quick points in my 10 minutes. Now, just in case we run out of time, uh, the ninth and 10th of those points are particularly brilliant. Um, <laughs> so do try and uh, stay awake. They're worth waiting for. Um, first point, and Matthew's made this point, really. UK productivity is experiencing its worst of stasis uh, since at least 1880, possibly, arguably, since the Industrial Revolution. Put differently, uh, the economic cost of that productivity flatlining for a decade is already, already multiples uh, of any estimate of the prospective cost of even the worst-case Brexit. Right? So the UK's productivity crisis is the signature economic policy issue of the day, bar none. Second point, uh, the previous government's uh, industrial strategy, uh, which Matthew mentioned, uh, was put in place a couple of years ago to try and fix just this problem. And the Industrial Strategy Council, which Matthew also mentioned, which I chair, which Matthew uh, uh, is a member of, was put on earth to evaluate the success of that strategy. Uh, given point one, in other words, the ongoing productivity crisis, you'd be forgiven for thinking the government and the Industrial Strategy Council aren't doing an especially good job. Third point, actually, you wouldn't be forgiven for thinking that. Because um, I don't think government policy should shoulder all or even most of the blame for that crisis. Structural policy actions by governments, we know, take years, if not decades, to find fruit and improve productivity. And anyway, productivity problems, and indeed solutions to those problems, are ultimately rooted uh, in businesses, in business decisions by firms rather than those by governments. And it's clear from the evidence that the UK's productivity problem uh, can be traced to a long uh, and lengthening tale of UK companies whose business decisions have meant their productivity has stagnated for a decade uh, and counting. Well, this is sometimes called the productivity puzzle. In actual fact, what's puzzling is not that we have too few explanations for weak productivity, but that we have so many uh, from weakening investment uh, to creaking infrastructure, uh, from skills that are lacking uh, to management uh, that is slacking. And no doubt all of those have been ingredients in the productivity mix, as Matthew mentioned. If the UK economy uh, were a person, we'd say it was a complex uh, needs case. Fourth, with the publication of today's report, uh, excellent report, I should say, uh, another ailment has been added to the economy's medical record, namely the quality of work, or rather the lack uh, thereof. Now, you might think 
that the last thing we need right now is yet another explanation of what's gone wrong uh, productivity-wise. But that, too, I think, would be the wrong conclusion. As the collection of essays makes really clear, there are sound, both conceptual and empirical, reasons for thinking work quality and productivity are intimately linked in ways which hitherto have been not properly understood or indeed properly uh, explored. Fifth, uh, we already know from many years uh, of research that another key aspect of work, namely pay, is closely linked to productivity. The two have moved in lockstep for at least the last uh, thousand years, including, of course, over the last 10 years. That's why the lost decade for productivity has coincided, but not coincidentally, with a lost decade for real pay as well, as I'm sure Kate uh, will discuss. We also know from that research that this relationship between pay and productivity is, like all good relationships, a two-way one. Yes, uh, rises in productivity pay for pay rises. What else could over the longer run? But rises in pay may themselves also cause higher levels of productivity. For example, by building commitment and satisfaction among workers uh, in their jobs. Uh, economists like me even have a special name for this. They call it the catchily titled efficiency wage uh, theory. Sixth, when it comes to the relationship between another aspect of work, namely its quality and productivity, however, there's far less research to draw on. And it's this that makes this collected volume really so valuable. Even before today, there'd been good progress made, uh, for example, in joint work between Carnegie and the RSA on developing uh, metrics of work quality. And of course, uh, Sarah, I'm sure, will mention some of that. And of course, Matthew himself, his own terrific report back in 2017, the Taylor Review, uh, set out a lot of the issues extremely clearly. Building on those foundations, today's collection of essays asks the next logical question, namely, uh, could work quality hold the key, or at least one of them, to the UK's poor productivity performance? And my reading of the collection would be that the answer to that uh, is provisionally, if not definitively, uh, a yes. Like pay and productivity, that relationship is two-way. It is the case that highly performing companies are more likely to offer their workers secure and engaging uh, work. But the reverse relationship is also there uh, in the data and indeed in companies' own experience. That is to say, more secure and engaging work can itself serve as a spur to productivity by adding to worker uh, motivation and development. I'm going to officially christen this efficiency work theory as distinct from efficiency wage theory, which now I've said it, is even less catchy uh, than the first one. Seventh, um, this relationship appears strongest uh, in the lower tail of the work quality distribution, which is to say that the productivity gains would probably be largest if a minimum set of thresholds were to be set for work quality sort of a minimum work rather than minimum wage standards, if you like. As Matthew puts it in his essay in the collection, here is a, a rare example of a divine policy coincidence, one where boosting economic efficiency and enhancing social justice are coterminous. More broadly, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to hypothesize that the long and lengthening tail of companies offering poorer quality work has been a significant causal factor in explaining that long 
and lengthening tail of low productivity companies. Eighth, almost there. Uh, this body of work is already beginning to shape parts of the public policy agenda and deserves to. Almost all the recommendations in Matthew's review are, I believe, being acted on. And one of the roles of the Industrial Strategy Council, in fact, will be to keep the government's feet to the flame on implementation. A second way in which the ISC has already um, made use of the work on show is by using some of those quality of work metrics in its own framework for evaluating the success of the government's industrial strategy, which we published towards the end of uh, last year. Now, um, I've reached my ninth and tenth points, and that, do I not have enough time to give them? So now is the time to convince the watch. Actually, all that brilliant after all. Um, but um, let me give them to you anyway, because they concern what might happen next. How might we go from here? Well, my hope would be that work on the quality, work quality, productivity uh, nexus could and should be explored further and in greater depth, perhaps on a sectoral basis, perhaps seeking to better understand what dimensions of work quality matter most, perhaps teasing out how issues of work quality interact with the other factors important for shaping productivity. For example, are the payoffs from investing in staff larger in some industries or when accompanied by other actions? Last and the final point, I began uh, by saying that boosting productivity is ultimately about improving the micro, that is businesses and their decisions as a means to a macro end. And to that end, let me pose a question uh, for the room. Is there a case for a much stronger presumption than at present that individual companies publish data on a regular basis, on a standardized basis, on a whole variety of metrics of work quality as part of their regular reporting. Just look at how, for example, uh, gender pay gap or ESG reporting has served as a stimulant, as a spur to action among companies on issues around diversity and sustainability. Perhaps we need the same sprinkling of company level transparency to help tackle our work quality and ultimately productivity problems. Like good work, I believe that sprinkling of transparency uh, could work. On that note, Matthew, I will stop. Thank you for listening. It's an enormous pleasure <laughs> to introduce Kate Bell. <laughs> Um, well, thanks very much, Matthew, um, and I was going to say it's a huge privilege to be here, but of course now I'm not entirely sure whether I should be or not, <laughs> but um, thank you very much, it really is a privilege, and I'm really grateful to the Carnegie Foundation, um, both for asking me to contribute an essay to this collection and to be on this really nice panel, um, so thank you. It's also really great to follow Andy. Um, I guess I can say, first of all, the answer to your last question is yes. Um, that's something we've been campaigning for for a long time, is quality of work indicators in company reporting. Um, and I guess we're going to start talking about the efficiency work theory as another way of talking about what trade unions have been arguing for some time, that um, the UK's 3.7 million insecure workers do, their work conditions do have a lot to do with our kind of productivity crisis. But I guess um, one of the reasons it was really nice to be asked to write this essay was because it kind of enabled me to think a bit on the kind of longer term perspective and think about kind of, well, what's happened when we've had kind of our big jumps forward in productivity kind of over history? And I guess the kind of ones we all think of are really kind of jumps forward that haven't had good consequ consequences for workers. So if we saw the first industrial revolution as our kind of leap forward in productivity, that, of course, was not only built on innovation, but also on sweated labour. And when we saw the IT revolution in the 1980s, that had really significant implications for workers. So we saw technology enabling the better coordination of supply chains, and that enabled both the offshoring of industry and the outsourcing of labour. 
And that, of course, had implications for workers both here in the UK and in the global south. But I think we can take a much more optimistic view of current debates about kind of technological innovation and why they might lead to higher productivity. And I think our current debates are emphasising the importance of human labour. So you see innovation, ideas and trust being put centre stage in generating value. And this seems like it should be a really good context in which we'd be talking about achieving both good quality work and increases in productivity at the same time. But we know, of course, that that's not going to happen on its own. And in previous waves of technological change, workers have had to fight pretty hard to ensure work of good quality at the same time as productivity improvements. Of course, trade unions were formed to take on the new working conditions experienced in the Industrial Revolution and as a counterbalance against the concentrations of wealth and power that were produced then. Again, kind of in reaction to the changes in the 80s, we've had a kind of increasing realisation that the fact of the fact that work that has been moved offshore and out of sight should still be good work, and a lot of work going into kind of regulating global supply chains to ensure that. And I think here in the UK, you could probably see a lot of our p current political debate as a response to that failed programme of deindustrialisation in the 1980s. And the kind of levelling up task set by our current government could be seen as a consequence of some earlier trampling down. And of course, so how do we kind of stop that happening this time? And it's not going to surprise you to hear that the institutional setting, I think we need to see productivity and good work increase in tandem this time, is one in which social dialogue between workers through their trade unions and business plays a much more central role. I think it's a pretty obvious point that people normally respond better to change and produce better ideas when they're actually asked what they think and actually listen to. And of course, the empirical evidence also supports this. We know, for example, that trade unionised work workers which recognise a trade workplaces which recognise a trade union deal better with change and they're more likely to introduce high performance work techniques. And I think this is an argument that's actually gaining quite a lot of traction in international debate. So if you look at the OECD's new job strategy published last year, setting out their recommendations to governments across the world, they put social dialogue and collective bargaining at the heart of that, and particularly in dealing with new technological change. We've seen New Zealand introducing new um, uh, bargaining arrangements where workers can bargain right across their industries. Um, and of course, I'm not going to get into leadership contests here, but Elizabeth Warren has also proposed industry-level bargaining in arrangements in the US. So, of course, here the political context is pretty different. But I still think there's real opportunities in our current debate to embed this kind of approach. So just to give you a few of those, our government now is talking about a big investment in infrastructure. And whether that's in transport or energy, we're going to need workers to both build and deliver and maintain those projects. So there's a real opportunity for government to start talking about what are the conditions for quality work in those projects and how could we ensure those are high productivity and high quality jobs. We've got social care as a huge challenge. Um, if we're going to have a successful social care policy, it probably needs a workforce strategy. And that workforce strategy is probably going to work best if it actually involves workers and involves negotiation and dialogue. And of course, we're going to have a new set of trading relationships at some point. That's going to have a big focus on kind of the productivity of our own companies, their ability to compete abroad. And as kind of today's event is really focused on saying, we think delivering that productivity is going to ensure that real focus on quality work. So I think this debate, today's kind of panel, is a real sign that those arguments are starting to be heard. Um, I really hope we can continue to work together to ensure that they are and thanks very much again for inviting us to be part of the discussion. And finally, please welcome Tara Aller. Thank you so much for uh, the introduction and for the talks that have already been given. And thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, I am actually delighted to see you all here um, engaging in this incredibly important topic around good work. I think economists have a bit of a tendency to reduce everything to GDP, and of course that's not exclusively what we all care about. Um, and also the response that Matthew and the Carnegie Trust have had to asking for contributions to this book has been absolutely tremendous, and I really commend 
all the essays in there, they're all an incredibly rich source of evidence for us to start thinking about does good work actually contribute to productivity and the other way around, and what could we actually do about it? Now, in my couple of minutes, um, I really only have one message as opposed to 10, and so it's up to you to decide what's that, whether that's better or worse productivity than Andy, but my message is going to be around the importance of good management as a mediator both for good work and for higher productivity. But before I get into that in detail, I had some slides and I wanted to put up the first slide to just take a step back to say, well, what do we actually care about if it's not just the GDP? And I guess I am the agent here for doing that. Um, we actually know what contributes to people's life satisfaction. And some people might not agree that that's a worthy goal, but in my opinion, if we are to think about policy, ultimate policy outcomes, then having everybody be happier and more satisfied with their lives, to me, seems like a really good goal. And these, whoops, bubble sizes here give you an idea of how big an import, impact each of the different factors has uh, in people's life satisfaction. And there are three things that I wanted to draw out of these. First of all, you see the enormous importance of health, mental health in particular, but obviously physical and mental health are highly correlated, um, which has implications for what employers do with their workers. The second important bit is if you look at the pink not employed and the red income bubbles, it's clearly more important for people to actually have a job than the amount of money that they get paid for it. Um, and that's very important when it comes to us thinking about the trade-off that there might be in the future between employment and productivity. And then finally, the married slash cohabiting is just an indicator as to the importance of relationships. And it's not just relationships in kind of the broader sense, but it's also relationships at work. I'm sure you've heard of the famous, but also a little bit controversial question that the Gallup survey asks hundreds of thousands of people around the world about do you have a close friend at work? And that turns out to be the number one predictive factor for people's level of engagement with their employer and in their jobs. And we know that em engagement, on the other hand, leads to more satisfaction, but also higher productivity. So it's really important that employers think about this, not just through a commercial lens, but through that broader well-being lens. And then there's what I call the boss factor. Um, you've all heard that people don't leave a job and they don't leave a company, they leave a boss. Basically, because they don't um, perhaps enjoy working with that particular boss. The CBI surveys have consistently shown that if people are unhappy with their work, the number one reason is their boss. And something like 75% of people state that the most stressful thing about their job is their boss. And so you can see where I'm going here. If we were able to improve the quality of bosses in the UK then we would actually absolutely be driving both productivity and good work in a very, very significant way. However, when we're thinking about the future, we also need to think about the impact of technology on jobs in the first place, because people really do want to be employed, but also the quality of those jobs. Now, we've done a lot of research on the future work, automation, how it might impact labor markets. And there's some good news and there's some bad news. The good news that is that in, ag in the aggregate, we do expect the total number of jobs to actually go up and not down as a result of automation. And, you know, depending on how you read the evidence, actually a lot of these jobs will, in theory anyways, be more meaningful because they will be more people-facing. They will be in occupations where people report a sense of higher meaning uh, and purpose to what they're doing, especially in the healthcare and education sectors, but also in other sectors. The elephant in the room really is inequality, because however you do the modeling, you find out thinking, whoa, the job market's gonna get much more polarized. Um, from the employer's point of view, that means that the people that are already in high demand, that they find very difficult to recruit, that already demand very high wages, that they have to kind of keep looking for, are those same occupations that will continue to grow faster in the future. And um, this chart is from the employer perspective. Of course, the same works on the flip side for the society. So you can see we've looked at on the x-axis of current, current indicators of shortages in talent. Um, and then on the y-axis, we've looked at future indicators of shortages in talent, in, uh, talent including 
basically our projections of how much jobs will grow in each of those different occupations. And the colors are basically about how much people get currently paid. You can see that all the people on the right hand side, they will basically be facing a labor market in which there's loads and loads of demand and they probably will be uh, uh, relatively easy for them to find good work. Whereas the people on the left hand side who are already lower educated, who are already not basically getting paid very much, whose jobs are already under pressure, are equally not going to be seeing necessarily a pickup from this, um, from this automation trend. So when we think about it, it's going to be critical for employers as well as society to, to worry about those people. Um, from an employer perspective, it makes sense not to try and fish in the pond that's on the right hand side because you're going to have to pay massively to attract those people. It makes much more sense for you to be looking for diverse sources of talent. But you, of course, cannot just decide not to automate at all because that would leave you vulnerable to competition. So where is this all headed? I think that the real question is, well, if good management could be a driver of both good work and massively improve tech adoption and therefore improve productivity, why is it that we don't actually see more of it? And I think one of the reasons um, that we've diagnosed is what psychologists call overconfidence. 80% of businesses think they are more productive than the average. And the vast majority of CEOs think their business has adopted all those brilliant people practices that make their staff engaged, motivated, and um, essentially very productive. Whereas only about 40% of middle managers actually think that. And so we need to keep this message um, alive to keep talking about these win-wins. Basically, if you're a good manager, your staff is happier and you're going to be more successful. What's not to like, essentially. But we need to help people see that there's a lot of room for improvement in pretty much every company, whether you're in the long tail or you're in the kind of top end of the tail, a real frontier company. So I hope as part of this discussion, we can continue to share this idea that good work and productivity are complementary it's a win-win for the employer and the employee, and therefore any self-interested um, but enlightened employer will be pursuing both. Thanks. Great. Well, I'm going to ask uh, uh, each of our panel one question, but uh, invite the other members of the panel also to chip in, and then we'll, we'll, we'll open it up. So, uh, Andy, I thought I'd start by asking you, in a sense, to comment on what Tara said, because um, one of the worrying aspects of how people feel about the world is a pessimism about technology. So the RSA has done separate research around people's kind of sense of economic insecurity. And what we actually found was interesting was that uh, some people were worried they'd lose their job. But more people were worried their job was going to get worse, that they would be subject to more surveillance and more intensity, they'd lose uh, um, autonomy. So I'm just interested in this kind of relationship between technology adoption, employee engagement, and productivity. Um, and I guess I'm asking you to kind of reinforce the idea that, 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 that companies that engage their workforce in a positive conversation about technology and reassure them that technology won't, isn't there to, dip for, for, to, to, to worsen their jobs, are actually more likely to take up technology in the in most intelligent and effective way. Because technology adoption is part of our problem, isn't it? It, it certainly is. In terms of the, the, the diagnosis of our ills, I mean, a, among them, to that long list I mentioned earlier on, would certainly be include um, uh, the fact that technological trickle-down appears not to work. Like many types of trickle-down, actually. Um, technological uh, uh, doesn't. And the reason uh, why it doesn't has nothing to do with technology and everything to do with people. The reason technology fails is not because of technology, because of the people handling the technology. Um, so uh, I totally buy your, um, your diagnosis that um, if, we are to, um, uh, if we are to harvest the fruits of this fourth industrial revolution, new technological wave, uh, absolutely uh, that will require um, uh, an understanding among managers uh, of not just the opportunities, 
but the potential threats that might pose to workers and a careful explanation uh, of how that technology is best to be deployed. I think engagement is key there. Uh, as someone said to me today, you know, too, too often in businesses, when technology is broad, the idea is uh, you have your business model. This is a piece of kit which will allow you to, to carry out your business, run your business more effectively. Or in actual fact, the right question is, how best might this piece of kit enable you to re-engineer mm -hmm. uh, your business? And if that is to be done, and it's those changes that really are transformative, that is best done through engagement by workers, because they, be they best know the business model as it is today. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just reinforce that in that, in that I think that um, what we tend to do when we think about technology is we think about how it's going to impact the business as it currently is. What we don't recognize is the way it might change the business. And this yeah. is true of sectors as a whole. So sometimes I talk about the music industry, where 10 years ago people thought the music industry was going to doom. And its value proposition was destroyed by pirating and by very cheap downloading. People didn't predict two things. They didn't predict that your telephone your mobile device would turn into a mixture of a kind of radio station and a record collection, that people just listen to music a lot more. People, there's probably several people in the room listening to music as we speak. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and that secondly, we would go from having kind of 10 music festivals a year to 1,000 music festivals a year. Yeah. So what happened is the model changed, and people yeah. gave music for free in order to sell tickets to stuff that was live. Music industry is thriving, but the model has changed. Yeah. And, and we're very bad, I think, at predicting how technology might shift business models. And often employees are very good at seeing exactly. that possibility. Exactly. I mean, to the point, uh, Tara made this point, uh, which is that, I mean, the one thing that we know that technology automation can do well is to automate away stand, aut uh, standardized tasks of lowest type. Um, uh, and standardized tasks are not the sorts of things that give workers great agency, whereas the non-standardized bits, which are hardest to automate, are the things that give workers engagement. And, yeah. and that is the the good news part of this that's often lost in, trans, lost in, lost in translation. Great, thank you. Um, Kate, on this issue of engagement, um, and I'm going to use this as a, as a plug as well for, for the reform that's coming. So uh, in April, one of the recommendations that I uh, made, which the government is carrying out, there will be a, a massive reduction in the threshold that is required for workers to, uh, in companies beyond a certain size, essentially to have independent representation and rights to information and consultation. And that's not trade union membership, it's not collective bargaining, but it is a form of industrial democracy, industrial engagement. I think in the past, the trade union movement has sometimes been rather ambivalent about those forms of engagement because they're not the full fat trade union recognition, collective bargaining that you want. Will we see a bit more enthusiasm from the trade unions uh, this time? <laughs> You know, we want to take every opportunity we can to increase that kind of um, dialogue and engagement in the workplace. And I think just on your last question, when you look at cross-national surveys of kind of optimism about technology in countries where social dialogue is well embedded, citizens are optimistic about the possibility of technological change. So you look at kind of Germany where they ran a two-year consultation on Industry 4.0, they engage not just trade unions and workers but civil society, and you see a kind of optimism and, you know, the possibility to deliver benefits. But yes, we absolutely kind of want to work with the information and consultation regulations. I suppose the thing we would say is, you know, why trade unions and collective bargaining is important is because it is fundamentally about that imbalance of power. And that's what, you know, trade unions provide an independent collective voice with the ultimate sanction. You know, I don't want to be talking about strikes here, but that is what uh, gives you your bargaining power and the ability to make your boss listen when they otherwise won't. Mm. And that's why, yes, we absolutely want to engage with it. It's vital, important. But the trade union model, you know, will, is always going to be our first go-to, um, you know, principle because it's the only thing that redresses the fundamental imbalance of power between the employer and workers. I think trade unions have got a really vital role to play in supporting those representatives and giving them the information that they need to be effective. And I think it also can often be a stepping stone to people feeling that trade unionism Absolutely. is the right thing for them to do. Tara, finally, with you before we open it up to, to the room more broadly. Um, Reskilling and learning at work. There's, there's, I've used the word pessimism already, but there's a certain amount of pessimism about the scope which really exists for reskilling, for people to be able to adapt during their working life. But yet, you know, the vast majority of people who are going to be working in 20 years are already in 
the workforce. What, what can you kind of tell us or give us a, uh, encouragement about the scope for the existing workforce, given the right kind of opportunities and the right support to be able to adapt to new challenges that are coming along? Well, I think there are a couple of things. First of all, I tend to say when we talk about the future work, et cetera, that the future work is already here. Because if you look at the kinds of occupations that have been shrinking and the kind of tasks in particular that have been going away and have been automated, you know, that's been happening for 20 years. It's just a very gradual change. And I think that's also going to be the case in the future. I don't see any sort of kind of cliff edge. People are going to need to adjust in their jobs. And that partly happens kind of as a natural part of, you know, just doing your job um, day in and day out. I think the challenge is whether employers and bosses recognize this win-win nature of investing in your people and investing in their skills and putting them in jobs that are most suited to them, which is not rocket science, but for some reason doesn't tend to happen uh, quite as much as it could. And I think there are two reasons why I'm fairly optimistic about this kind of lifelong learning being a way of closing some of those gaps. And the first one is that the costs of teaching and learning are, of course, coming down dramatically with the use of technology. Now, you cannot replace all of the learning with technology, but some of the prompts and the nudges and the information provision can be delivered digitally, and that's just a lot cheaper. And that means you can, for the same amount of money, essentially be helping people learn, a, a much broader set of people learn. Um, and the second is that I'm optimistic that we somehow avoid the historical mistakes of assuming that as and when we use automation to replace human tasks, that we should also be treating humans as machines. And we're looking to kind of just like use a sort of computer mentality to the whole organization. I'm hoping that we'll be able to get over that and say, okay, machines do what they do, but humans are actually much more complex than that. And if we can tap into that kind of positive energy that humans do bring to their jobs, if you really engage them, then we'll see a real win-win. And people will want to learn because that means that they will be able to do their jobs better and provide better customer satisfaction or, you know, have those friends at work or whatever it is. The kind of social nature of work, I think, needs to come to the fore. And if it does, then I think that has massive potential positive impacts for, you know, on-the-job learning. And is part of this about job design and about trying to design jobs in ways which provide better opportunities for upskilling or for the development of generic skills which give people that kind of transferability? I mean, I, I heard a the statistic that I heard today that I can't get out a lot this week that I can't get out of my head um, is that uh, I was told that in Oxford Street there are three police officers on duty at any time, but there are a thousand private security workers. Mm. Now, you, you think, well, that the scope for those private security workers to learn other skills, whether it's kind of anti-terrorism training or to be able to intervene in the public sphere or the relationship, you know, how they work. There's enormous scope, actually, for those people's jobs to become more interesting and for them mm. to develop skills which are more generic. I mean, actually, I don't suppose robots will be repair, re replacing private security people for some time. But yes. it's just an example of, 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 of where a bit of job design can enable a job to be a pathway rather than a dead end. Absolutely. Um, but I think both are important. So generic skills across the population, um, inevitably, because nobody can kind of top down, plan and manage all the transitions that are going to need to be taking place. Um, and we see generically a lack of digital skills. For example, in the UK, that's quite frankly fairly shocking slash scary. And so there will be something that needs to be done across the piece on essentially the kind of future skills that we will need, including digital, but also kind of social, emotional, sort of um, more complex cognitive type skills. At the same time, uh, larger employers, as, as I was impl implying earlier, you know, if they need those kind of cybersecurity experts or they need terrorism protection or whatever, if they go and try and find those people where they already are, they're going to have to pay top dollar, and they might not find them, not everybody anyways, because there's going to be a shortage of these people. And so the clever people will be looking at the skills of precisely, let's say, you know, security officers, 
and the kinds of people they need and saying, you know, there's only a, a limited amount of extra upskilling we're going to need to do. That's clearly net present value positive because it's much cheaper to do that than to go and try and hire somebody who's actually, quite frankly, quite likely to leave afterwards. Um, it takes a quite a different attitude, I guess, in, in HR as well in businesses to start thinking about that talent acquisition in a much more nuanced way. Great. So we've got a few minutes for, for questions and comments from uh, the floor. I can see a few hands going up. I think the way I'll do this panel, which is a bit unfair on you, is I'm going to take you know, a whole number of questions and point as many as I can over the next kind of 10 or minutes. And then I'm just going to ask you to pick a couple of those points to respond to. So you don't feel the need to respond to all of them. Just pick a couple to respond to. And I'm going to go across the room. So I'll start with one, two uh, hands there. If you could say your name when you ask the question or make your point. Um, thank you very much. My name's Anton Fishman. Um, I, I came here with um, high hopes but low expectations. Um, the high hope was I would come away getting a real sense of what good work was. Um, my expectation was that we would get multiple definitions, which is really what we've had. And it ranges from good work is work that leads to productivity, to satisfaction, to empowerment, interesting work, um, well-paid work, um, autonomous work, secure work. We, we've heard probably 10 definitions of good in, in the half hour that we've been listening to. And I still don't get what makes my work gooder than it was yesterday or how I make, a, a, as a manager or a boss, the work that those who work for me more good. And I would just like a sense of clarity because it feels a little bit patrician that we're telling other people what's good. And if I asked half a dozen people or, or, or 500 people, what is your work good and what would, it, and what would make it good? We were, might not get the same sorts of answers that I think I'm hearing from you. Okay, I might try and pick that one up, or else I can refer you to the previous Carnegie RSA report, which was exactly an attempt to answer that question. But, um, yeah, uh, yes. Uh, Mike Joffe, Imperial College. It's actually going back to the, um, like more the structure of, of uh, companies and industry more than about what can be done with the existing structures. So it goes back really to what Andy Haldane was saying about the long tail and the length, I think the lengthening, lengthening tail of unproductive and poor quality employing firms. I'm just wondering, in, in the last 30, 40 years, we've been encouraged to have an entrepreneurial society. And I think the idea was that entrepreneurial was more inventive, but actually the evidence is um, entrepreneurs are lower productivity, they, they may enjoy what they're doing, but they're, they're lower productivity than people who work in, um, say, sizable firms, not necessarily big ones, but kind of traditional sized firms. And I just wonder whether the trend to this kind of set up your own business and being encouraged to do that has actually led to the, the tail lengthening and the de uh, relative decline of the more uh, prosperous, better employers. Okay, um, I'm going to come here because we haven't had a uh, woman ask a, a question yet. Um, Gail Mayhew, um, Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission. I'm slightly mystified, although I'm very interested in the report, why um, place hasn't figured in any dimension in your assessment of what makes good work or good lifestyles. Um, I'd just point to Tara's um, bubble diagram. Now, commuting might actually also be a very significant part of people's um, a sense of well-being around their work and um, the cost of that commute to and from. Interesting report from the Institute of Fiscal Studies about f uh, 12 months ago showed that women having had a child are much less apt to commute for longer than 40 minutes building in a glass ceiling to the physical footprint of cities. And I'd really urge, um, actually, Mr. Haldane especially, to take this concept of place competitiveness, which a number of us are beginning to explore, and look at how that marries up with um, questions around competitiveness. I think what it could also do is for those poor people who sit on the left-hand side of the second diagram, Tara, even if they aren't going to get satisfaction from their work, we could actually find ways of making life really you know, quite nice for them, even if it isn't work that is actually the propulsion towards a good life. 
Okay, I mean, Andy may respond to that, well, I'm sure he did a very good speech about place last year, which I'd encourage you to read. But um, uh, back row. Yeah, uh, ben Wilmot, um, head of policy Hi for there. the CIPD. Um, yeah, the question um, on the issue around uh, enforcement. I mean, I, I think for the question for the Industrial Strategy Council, you know, should a much more progressive labour market enforcement um, approach, which places as much focus on helping small businesses improve their management practices as on fining and naming and shaming, is that, should that be part of an approach to, to, to focus on helping uh, to shift the dial on poor quality work, lift more poor quality work towards the average. Our research with small firms suggests that the level of people management capability with small firms is very low. <coughs> Most of them are struggling to comply with um, basic employment regulation. But actu actually when you provide trans you know, that sort of transactional support, help with written terms con conditions, um, job descriptions, appraisals, that type of um, support, although it's transactional, is actually transformational and we found was associated with improvements in workplace relations, labour productivity and uh, financial outcomes for the small firms in the evaluation of the pilots we've ran. So, yeah, I just I wonder if there's any interest in that issue around trying to integrate enforcement within a, a wider approach to improving employment standards and uh, people management standards across the UK. Thank you. Uh, there's um, uh, a lady here and there's a gentleman back there. Pass it forward, and then two rows back to the general staff. S S Sally Prentice, I'm a student. I'm going to pick up on Kate's point about social care, and we're all very familiar with the terrible terms and conditions people have to put up with today. If you go back 40 years ago, home helps, as they were known, they were employed by the council, they got good terms and conditions, union protection... But more importantly, there was lots of training available for people. And you might start as a home help, but you could go on and run a day centre, sheltered housing. In enlightened local authorities, you could train to be a social worker. And I think there's no comparison of which working environment people would choose if they were given the choice. Yep, thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Tim Nevins, a writer at uh, Free Range Economist. Uh, my question is to do with... Um firms, businesses, and uh, I agree with the concept that uh, good work can improve productivity and efficiency, but if uh, that is the case, why have firms been so slow to pick up and put it in place? Because obviously if it's supposed to be so good for business, businesses obviously should be putting it in place themselves rather than being prompted to do so by government. Okay, great questions. Okay, I'm sorry for those people I didn't call, but that's, that's quite a lot of questions for people to deal with. They've only got 90 seconds each. Uh, Tara, do you want to start? Sure, I'll, I'll touch on a couple of those things. First of all, the question about definition of good work. Well, I think, well, there already is one, and I think, yes, we need to standardise that in order to do anything about transparency and reporting. But ultimately, if you're a good boss, you ask your people. And it might be a very subjective experience, and every one of your people might need a different thing for them to feel that their work is good. But that's your job as a boss to tailor the work such that you're making the most of your team. And surely the team's well-being is really at the heart of it. So I wouldn't get too kind of theoretical about it. I would just kind of say all bosses need to go on emotional intelligence training. Um, they need to understand the concept of psychological safety. They just need to have the right incentives to, to care. And I suspect that if they did, they themselves would be much happier as well. Um, on the question around entrepreneurship and uh, self-employment, etc., well, I think the, the diagnosis sounds about right, that those kinds of businesses tend to be less productive. But on the other hand, people who are in them tend to be more satisfied. Certainly, that's my understanding of the self-employed report that was put out a little while ago. Um, but if I had to choose, even though I'm an economist, I'd rather have happy people and slightly lower productivity. In the very long term, of course, we need to be concerned about our, our competitiveness. Uh, and some of the work we've done around trade suggests that actually more and more sectors are becoming tradable. We used to have this idea of there are some tradable sectors and then there are the non-tradable sectors. But actually, increasingly, services can be delivered digitally. And so actually, competition from other countries will hit those sectors as well, um, which means that we're going to need to... Um, 
essentially keep going uh, with this idea of I'm not sure about how we nudge all those businesses to take up good productivity, enhancing productivity practices as well as tech adoption, because neither of those is really trickling down. And I suspect part of it is that we haven't, as economists, fully understood that the people who run those businesses are also people. They're busy, you know, they're distracted, they're fighting fires, and even though their intentions might be the right, in the right place, it's quite hard for them to extract them from, from the kind of day-to-day. Um, and my final point is going to be on commuting because I, I just want to emphasize how critically important that is. Having read the glass ceiling report and having kind of thought, wow, this is really, really important. And also having worked at the Department for Transport. Um, yes, that needs to be part of, of course, the overall uh, conception of good work. Whether it's the employer or um, the government or the locality or whatever, some community type action, I think is probably one of the hardest questions. Because at the moment, it does seem to be slightly falling through the cracks in terms of how we truly Im improve the quality of people's lives while they're commuting or reduce the amount of time that they need to commute for. Okay. Um, so thanks. Um, I was going to pick up on the first comment about patrician definitions of, of work and say again, just like Tara, basically, that that's why voice and empowerment are so important, because if you want to know what good work is in your particular workplace, you ask your workers. Um, I wanted to pick up on the point around enforcement um, and say I think we're getting into a bit of a kind of false choice between kind of carrot and stick, and clearly we need both. Um, you know, there are some pretty good guidelines out there for employers, and sometimes the, oh, I didn't know the guidance, it's like, well, here's 30 pages on how to do it. Um, or maybe, and here's a short thing, and here is the HMRC helpline on the national minimum wage. Sometimes it is an excuse, and that's why you need the kind of stick there. But an approach which encourages people to do the right thing, of course, of course, is good. Um, Sally, thank you for the comment. Um, I think that's really insightful, and it made me think of something that we've been kind of trying to think about and not worked out how to do yet and interested in colleagues on the panel's views on how to do it, which is to think a bit about how ownership structures actually influence good work. And it kind of goes a bit to the point around entrepreneurship as well. And also that point about kind of why are firms slow to pick up this up? And we, this is like super anecdotal, but we hear things about how, for example, um, private equity has a certain view of what staff costs should be in the business or um, other ownership structures, you know, have a certain management style which influences, um, or, you know, whether it's kind of um, shareholder dividends rather than a long-term investment approach. So I think there's a really interesting piece of work to be done around how different ownership structures actually affect the implementation of this conversation and of what should be obvious around the links between good work and productivity. Great. Andy? Well, let me try and pick up a couple. I mean, on the, the one about uh, startups, I mean, we know that one of the key sources um, uh, of productivity growth would be having a, a dynamic uh, company sector. How do you measure, measure dynamism? Well, one metric on that is the degree of entry and, as important, the degree of exit. High levels of entry and exit are a sign of dynamism, are the seed corn of productivity. Um, by the way, the exit part is as important as the entry part, which is a point not to lose sight of. Um, one of the reasons industrial policies in the past have failed is because they lost sight of just that fact. Um, on the entry, though, that does mean that other things equal, high levels of entrepreneurship, of startup, ought to be a good thing, especially because, although small tomorrow, you would hope some of those startups at least would scale up and become oak trees from acorns. You know, more acorns, more oak trees, ergo... Uh, good thing. Now, a sale of that um, qualified in only one respect, which is despite levels of entry, startup in this country having picked up, as you say, I think something like a thousand new businesses a day, is that right? Uh, in the UK, I'll just throw that, fa that fact out, it may not be true, but I think that uh, is roughly about right. Um, what we do poorly is scale up. We do start up well and scale up uh, poorly. And it's, of course, at the scale-up point you harvest those economies of scale and scope that deliver productivity improvements. And more could uh, and should be done on that front. A lot has been done, including the patient capital review from the Treasury uh, of about a year uh, ago. On, on place, and, and I mean, I couldn't agree more, 
Um, and, and more importantly than me saying that, the government is saying that pretty much uh, every working business day now, which is uh, even better. It's saying it because regional imbalances in this country uh, are larger than any other part of uh, Western Europe and are at their highest level for at least 100 years, uh, perhaps uh, more. We sit here, and this speaks to a terrorist point about productivity isn't everything, because we sit here in, by a long way, the most productive and the highest income uh, region in the <coughs> whole of Europe. But we also sit here in what is, by some margin, the most miserable place in the UK. Um, <laughs> Uh, and my casual empiricism, Matthew, on the train every morning rather confirms that <laughs> fact. Uh, I mean, among the reasons for that, there isn't one factor, but one of the most important ones is the one you mention, because Londoners have, by some margin, the shortest traveling distance to work, but by a factor of two, uh, the longest commute time uh, to uh, work. In fact, the commuting point uh, applies to pretty much all of the UK's big cities. The places we'd say we're doing well, which isn't just London, I'd include uh, Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, Newcastle, uh, Edinburgh, Glasgow, uh, Belfast, Cardiff, Bristol. All of those thriving cities punch below their international weight when it comes to productivity. And one of the key reasons for that is because their local, keyword, local transport systems are so poor. That effectively shrinks the effective working population of those cities and therefore means they can't harness the benefits of scale, agglomeration benefits, one would expect uh, to have. So it would be great, as we are begin to be having a different conversation about infrastructure, if that conversation wasn't dominated by blockbuster, big ticket, three-letter alphanumeric projects of various types that will go <laughs> nameless, but as importantly, thought local. The local metro system, the local bus service, the local train service, because that ultimately could help us hoover up more of those city-based agglomeration benefits, to say nothing of the social benefits of connected, connecting some of the more disconnected parts of the UK. Thank you. So um, just one point from me, which is the importance of labor supply chains. So on the upside, uh, large companies can be very effective in helping medium-sized and smaller companies to improve their employment practices, to get their head around the complexity of the minimum wage or whatever it might be. On the downside, overly complex, too many layered labor supply chains. The more layers you've got, the more complex they are, the more danger there is that there is non-compliance and bad practice taking place there. Uh, the RSA is doing a small project with the CIPD looking at best practice in labor supply chain management, which will be publishing in a couple of months' time. Um, so uh, this wonderful book uh, um, and work is only possible because of the generous support of uh, Carnegie, Carnegie UK Trust and their brilliant team there. So please uh, welcome to give some closing <coughs> Uh, comments from the Carnegie Trust, Sarah Davidson. Thanks very much uh, for that, Matthew, and thank you for all the panel and to those of you who've contributed from the audience for giving us such a stimulating conversation this evening. And just before we end, I'm going to come back in a moment to pull out what seemed to me some interesting uh, themes that came up throughout the whole of the discussion. But I just want to start off by saying a few words about the Carnegie UK Trust and why it is that we have ended up supporting and being interested in this field of endeavour. For over 100 years now, the Carnegie UK Trust has sought to advance the well-being of the people of the UK and Ireland. And we've been prominent amongst those who have promoted a much more holistic way of investigating and quantifying social progress than a narrow focus on economic progress. We are therefore really interested in what are the things that make for well-being, both individual well-being and community and society well-being. And of course there are lots of things and we've heard about a number of them this evening. But we know that paid work is central to our well-being because it helps us to get on in life financially, 
It gives us a sense of purpose, a sense of identity and status, and offers us some really important opportunities to participate in our society. But the world of work and the economy as we know it are changing, as Matthew said at the very outset this evening. And our well-being is clearly not only affected by having access to work, by what, by, but also by what our very personal individual experience of that is. And for that reason, in recent years, the Trust has invested in and has worked alongside others on a variety of projects to try and understand how work can develop in a way which continues to enhance well-being and hopefully enhances it even more than has been the case to date. As has already been mentioned, we have published work on measuring and quantifying well-being, and I absolutely do commend that to you. Uh, the 18 measures, uh, suggested indicators of well-being that we identified there absolutely prioritise what the individual's experience of work is, and we worked with colleagues at the CIPD on understanding what those might be. Demonstrating that good work has a central role in improving productivity is just one of the many things that we do in relation to work, but we have been really interested and delighted by how much interest there is in that. And I think the number of people that have come out on a Thursday night in January here attests to that. For us, it is all part of building and winning the argument that good work matters, and it should be part of our ambitions for all the economy and for society. I was really encouraged this evening uh, to hear the extent of unanimity, actually, that there appeared to be amongst all of our speakers, and not only about the quality of the essays in the book that had been produced. And I just want to very briefly draw out five things around which it seemed to be that there was a degree of coalescing. And the first of those is about the importance of understanding, understanding the issues, and hence the importance of research and evidence and curiosity and inquiry of the kind exemplified in these essays. And that question Andy posed about how, how you might go deeper, I'm really interested in what going deeper might look like, and uh, we'll be interested to hear from some of you here later what you think uh, might be the scope for further exploration. And the second was the repeated references to the power of data and transparency. And that's both to enhance comprehension and also as a lever for change and for accountability. I thought Terry's example, Terry's example about 80% of businesses thinking that they are above average is a really good example of that place where well-used and well-applied data could actually drive change. And the third commonality, I think, was the extent to which uh, everybody is not necessarily predominant, in, in this debate, is not necessarily predominantly motivated by productivity um, as an end in itself. And of course, productivity is not an end in itself. But this notion that quality of work has benefits which accrue to individuals, to families, to communities, as a, uh, in addition to whatever it can help uh, around productivity. And again, Terry's blobs, I thought, really reminded us about that. And that brought me to the other thing, which has been a very evident theme running all through all of tonight's discussion, is this question of what matters to people. And it felt to me that people, citizens, individuals, employees, have been really present in tonight's discussion. And I was very encouraged by that. So whether it's people's mental and physical well-being, whether it's their interpersonal relationships, the commute to work, the nature of the places they live in, all of these things feel very important. And then finally, I took from the speakers this evening a really palpable sense of optimism. Um, and you know, the, the, the notions of optimism and pessimism were raised, and it was very clear that, that things can contribute to whether or not we are collectively optimistic. But it felt to me as though we are surrounded by possibilities which are inherent in the challenges of today and that lots of people have ideas about how you can make the most of those opportunities and I think that's a very very optimistic note to end this evening on. So to sum up I want to thank Matthew and the team here at RSA who have been huge supporters and fellow travellers of the work that we've been doing. Uh, Matthew chaired all of the expert group uh, meetings which ultimately led to bringing together this essay collection and has been uh, a good friend and a good challenger throughout that. But we're also really grateful to the team here who helped put on such a good event tonight. I'm grateful for all the excellent speakers who have helped to uh, stretch our thinking and also to all of those who contributed essays to the collection and I know that many of you have been able to join us this evening. I hope that you are able to continue to enjoy the hospitality this evening on uh, behalf of us and, and of Matthew, delighted to ask you if you can to come downstairs to Rathmore's and join us for a drink to continue the discussion uh, before you go out into the evening and staff will be on hand to show you the way. So finally, it just remains for me to ask you to join me in thanking all of our speakers for their contribution this evening.